I'm Marty Stauffer. Some of our wild animals are sleek and beautiful, and some are, well, sort of ugly. At first glance, the moose is awkward, ungainly, almost prehistoric looking. Although lacking in form, in function, it's perfectly adapted to its environment. To the Athabascan Indians of Alaska, the moose is a life giver. They call it Denigi. For thousands of years, they've celebrated it in their songs and stories. But recent generations of these native people have been torn between the modern world of the white man and the one they inherited from their ancestors. Let's learn more about the Athabascan people and their changing relationship to nature. Along the way, we'll also learn why few animals are magnificent as a moose. Mirror images of the Alaska Range and Mount McKinley reflect brilliantly from thousands of lakes and ponds in central Alaska. The 20,000-foot peak towers above interior Alaska, overlooking the home of thousands of wild animals and the Athabascan people. The Athabascan Indians call this mountain Denali, which some say translates as the Great One. Moose inhabit forests and willow-laden marshes throughout much of our northern latitudes from Alaska down through the Rocky Mountains. They are among the few species of wildlife that have increased in recent years. Today, there are almost a million moose in North America, more than twice as many as were present just 30 years ago. Humans are not the only species which depend on moose for food. Grizzly bears and wolves also prey on them. In fact, humans and wild predators are increasingly competing with one another for moose. The Athabascans once hunted moose with bow and arrow and snares, so their very livelihood depended on an intimate knowledge of the animals they hunted. They inherited much of this knowledge from their ancestors in the form of songs and stories. Songs of grizzly bears, moose, and beaver continue to be passed down. But recently, the songs are beginning to fade, and their meaning is being lost. Minto is a small Athabascan village in interior Alaska. Its several hundred residents still live a primarily subsistence lifestyle. The land provides them with an abundance of salmon, waterfowl, moose, and caribou. Life is changing rapidly for all the people of Minto, but this is especially true for 91-year-old Peter John. His generation traded bow and arrow, canoe, and dog team for rifle, motorboat, and snowmobile. All were good trades from a survival standpoint, but none have come without a cost. Let's listen to the words of Peter John. But what I seen is altogether gone today, but the memory is still there. And you can't forget what happened many years ago. By looking across the country here, I think about my great great grandfather. People didn't have no tea, no sugar, no flour, no vegetables. Let's make it. God made this world and everything that's in it. And when he done that, he put the animals in it. 
in this world. And these animals have to eat the leaves, the willows, whatever there is. And God put medicine in there. That's what the animals live on, the medicine. So when we eat that, it helps our body to be strong and healthy. When I shot my first moose, I was about 12 years old. There's a lot of things that's going along with it. My first moose I shot is I have to give it to the old people in order for me to hang on to what I've done. When they move out, they catch moves. They look for the best make part of that. With seven, eight, nine families together. Moose meat is special. How they take care of it, how they smoke it, everything is connected with that. In the early part of uh, the Athabascan culture stand for a lot of things that's, that we don't have right now. We lost many all of it. A long time before our time, people used to know what to take and what's not to take. You have to understand that the animals you take is very important to your grandchildren. The Athabascan way is not like the white man way. The first moose he catch and the first moose that he, I want him to catch is good moose. One shot, that's all it's going to take to catch that moose. Because you make two, three shots, then that's the way the bullet's going to travel all his life. I'm an Indian. That's the kind of a life I choose me. I don't know what kind of a life you choose. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. You're white and you got a way better education than I got. But the education I got, you'll never get it. No way. Because I'm the last one that knows about it. I'm seeing two songs here, and the man that made these songs is an expert on bear. <laughs> When bear the hibernate all winter, in the springtime, when the calf, when they go and hunt for calf and kill them. This calf died several days after birth. It's only a matter of time before its scent reaches the keen nose of a grizzly or a wolf. But the cow remains faithfully by its side. For days, she tries in vain to rouse her dead calf.
There is so much bear today that um, they most they go to the water and they follow that water. They walk in the water for miles. Even that, the bear will find them just so that they can have a young one. They try to get away from the bear all they can by walking in the water. That don't that don't stop the bear. But when a grizzly tackle the moose, you kill him. It's like killing a rabbit. Wolfish, I don't like it. As I see him where he kill moose, he got no mercy for nothing. Just kill him, cow and calf, just like killing rabbits. I've seen him done that a lot of times. And he hunts just like a human being. Because I've seen a lot of places where he kill moose. In some areas of Alaska, grizzlies and wolves kill 80% of the moose calves before they're three months old. Ecologists once thought that predators caught mainly old and weak animals, having little impact on the populations of their prey. Recent studies have shown that predators are indeed having an impact on moose populations. Fortunately, some calves survive, and by midsummer, they're large enough to outrun most predators. Moose spend much of the summer feeding in ponds on aquatic vegetation. It's rich in sodium, and this aids in growing a new coat. Beavers play an important role in improving moose habitat by building dams and creating ponds. Willow and alder grow in the riparian areas surrounding the ponds, providing both beaver and moose with an important source of food. By building dams, these industrious rodents provide a home for many species of wildlife. When beavers abandon the pond, it becomes a lush meadow, which benefits yet other animals. This grizzly has killed a moose and returned to feed on it. Bears rarely kill adult moose unless they catch them mired in mud or snow, but when they do, they have enough food for a week or more, provided a larger bear does not lay claim to the carcass. Many Alaskans don't like sharing moose and feel predators should be controlled, thereby leaving more moose for humans Yet predators are an important part of the natural environment, essential to healthy ecosystems. Are there enough moose for both human and non-human predators? And if not, how do we strike a balance between the two? These are hard questions, and there are no easy answers. Right now you see more moose because that's what the people live on many years ago for food and clothing, and they don't try to kill all the game off the country, but the thing is this, that they have to meet and close, so they kill whatever there is. And 
them days there was no game warden. And the federal government got nothing to do with what, what we could. But as an Indian, everything we catch is very important to the family. So we have to take care of it. Many, many years ago, where the animals talk true the person. And that's the one they see. The Athabasca culture. This world is not the way God made it. It's altogether different. So therefore, we're giving the animals the hard time, which they didn't earn. But us contaminate the water, the air, even the grass, leaves, everything what animals live on is contaminated. The white people, well, I don't blame them. It's okay. I'm not against them. But we should understand that God made this world and everything that's in it so that you and I can live. But then we destroy ourselves by destroying what God made. As the long days of summer shorten, the antlers of bull moose reach massive proportions. Some are more than six feet from tip to tip. Moose are the largest member of the deer family, and the subspecies that lives in Alaska is the largest of all. Some bulls weigh almost a ton. It's their great size that makes them so valuable to the Athabascans. One moose can feed an entire village for days. The bloody velvet, which has nourished the growing antler, begins to peel away in great sheets. Bulls will spend the next several weeks searching for cows, sparring with other bulls, and preparing for the rut. The rut, or mating season, is a demanding time for bulls. Many will be gored in fights, and some will die. Occasionally, the combatants lock antlers, resulting in a long, slow death, unless predators find the struggling victims and put an end to their misery. Once I was out, this is a long time ago, no game war. I shot three moves. There was two boys with, with me. They told me, you were shooting with that cow. I tell them, everything go. So we went there. We put shirt and put it away. I tell them, boys, you go and put it away. I tell them, boys, you go. I started playing. I started praying, but I asked for help so that the animals don't touch it, because there's a lot of people in, in the village that need it. That's why I shot three of them. I went there and I prayed. I asked. God for helping me get what I want. So it's good to pray if you know what you pray to. As the rut commences, Cows gather into harems, and bulls begin to dig pits in which they urinate.
the urine contains pheromones that probably stimulate the cows to come into estrus. It also signals the bull's fitness to potential mates and opponents. Both sexes have distinctive calls, which aid in locating one another in the thick vegetation. The cow's call is termed a protest moan. It's thought that by vocalizing, the cows attract more bulls. More bulls means more competition, and more competition means a greater chance of finding the healthiest mate. These bulls have claimed the same harem, and neither is willing to relinquish it. Turning the head and racking the antlers shows their size to maximum advantage, but if the opponent is not impressed, a fight will follow. season, and the bull moose never eat for one month. Moose is just like a human being. Now, when he eats, the moose is going to take care of himself. It's very important the way he feeds. You don't just try to grab everything. The other basket means that don't hide whatever you catch from your friends. Because by hiding, you are not worth the lift of money people. Too much white man way. TV, tape recorder, everything. White man way. It was uh, 1971 when the first uh, road come in here. It's not fit for people, the road. It's, it's all right in a way, but uh, that drinking problem is too much for the native people. My grandchildren, I got nothing to leave with them. No money, nothing. But the only thing I'm going to live with, with them is that the films that we make. So I had to give them everything I got that I understand in life. How do you go to make it? I talk to them just like if I'm talking to you. And I don't hold nothing back. Try to give them the best I got. 
That ain't much. I'm not hiding anything from anybody. Alaskan natives have depended on moose for thousands of years. Yet these people are gradually losing touch with nature. We can record their stories and songs, but will future generations understand? Peter John has watched his people change from a subsistence lifestyle to one dominated by technology. And many Athabascans now find themselves trapped between these two worlds. The challenge is to adopt modern conveniences yet retain their own culture. Fortunately, there will be plenty of moose for future generations. These enormous ungulates are not exactly a thing of beauty, yet few creatures are magnificent as a moose. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America. I'm Marty Stauffer. Here in Philadelphia, the Liberty Bell is a famous symbol of freedom. In the same way, the white-tailed deer is a familiar and beloved symbol of the wild. And just as Pennsylvania is typical of what's best about American life, so the story of the whitetail in Pennsylvania shows that some wildlife can thrive in man's world. These deer are found in all of the continental United States, so they're not unique. The ones here are the same subspecies that's found all over the Northeast. But the Keystone State has been especially good for them. At the beginning of the century, hardly a white tail was left in Pennsylvania. Now there are almost a million. But success has two sides. Hunters and wildlife lovers see them as an asset. Farmers and lumber companies see them as a liability. Since almost all their natural predators are gone, without careful management, overpopulation can make them their own worst enemy. This is the story of how a wild creature can live with man. The story of the Pennsylvania whitetail. Pennsylvania, with its rolling hills and farmland, is pretty any time of year. But in autumn, it's spectacular. And when the nights turn frosty, the whitetail, too, reaches the peak of its powers. Naturalist Ernest Thompson Seton proclaimed the whitetail the swiftest, keenest, shyest, wisest, most prolific, and most successful of our deer. He also called this graceful creature the American deer. As much as it deserves these superlatives, the whitetail's success must be credited to human as well as to natural factors. the number one big game animal in the United States and has been for centuries. 
It fed and clothed the Indians long before white settlers arrived. And then it fed and clothed the settlers. In a sense, this deer made possible the very civilization that put it in jeopardy. Ironically, there are probably more deer now than before the white man came. In Pennsylvania's Cook State Forest, one of the last stands of virgin timber remaining in the east, we can see how a towering canopy of primeval trees limits the underbrush that whitetails depend on for food. Once the east was almost solid trees, the croplands and open woodlands that replaced the deep forest are more to the whitetail's advantage. Commercial hunting, above all, nearly destroyed the entire whitetail population in the east, and the spread of urban civilization slowed its recovery. That a healthy society must leave room for its wild creatures was recognized early in Pennsylvania, and whitetail numbers have been on the increase since the beginning of the century. Though man has taken over much of the protective role toward wildlife, a doe's instinct toward her fawns is no less strong than it's always been. The black bear is another large mammal that still roams the woods of Eastern America. Primarily a vegetarian rather than a predator, it presents little threat to a healthy doe or her fawns. Only a few short centuries ago, the doe would have had more to contend with. Mountain lions and even jaguars roamed Pennsylvania, along with packs of wolves. Now the only serious predator is man. Yeah, what's that? Looks like something's been rubbing on here. Yeah, and here too. I wonder what it was. Well, I don't know. Quietly, the doe leads her fawns away from danger. As she's taught them, each one finds its own hiding place. This pile of timber looks pretty dry. Yeah, but let's start with that one over the hill that I saw the other day. Well, we'll have to carry it. A whitetail mother will sometimes teach her offspring to hide by forcing them down with her nose or forefoot. In this case, the fawn has already learned its lesson. The doe knows that one of her fawns is hiding close by, but where's the other one? And is it safe? As reluctant as she is to leave her fawns, her instinct tells her that she must first protect her own life. Hey, what's this over here?
The doe cannot know that the woodsmen mean her fawn no harm. Let's go, we don't want to make her nervous. The doe is wise in her caution, but her offspring seem interested only in lunch. Not all fawns are so fortunate. Many are orphaned before they lose their spots. Most often, their mothers are hit by cars. Each year, upwards of 25,000 whitetails are killed on the highways of Pennsylvania. And in 1975, the toll reached almost 40,000. Pennsylvania has several rehabilitation centers for orphaned fawns, like this one near State College. Fawns whose mothers have been injured by cars or dogs are raised here until they're strong enough to be turned loose in the wild. Here it is. That's right. Come on. A fawn alone by the roadside may need help, but it's not a good idea to remove a fawn from its hiding place in the woods. The mother is probably very much alive and very close by. Summer is a refreshing time for everybody. The deer have shed their gray-brown winter coats and are now in their reddish-orange summer coats and the buck's new antlers are covered with tender velvet. One of the whitetail's worst problems is insects. Its thin summer coat affords little protection from the swarms of biting flies, mosquitoes, and midges. It's no wonder that many deer take to the water or stay in the tall grass to find relief from these tiny tormentors. But the weather is mild and food is plentiful, or at least it is where deer herds are not fenced into areas too small to support their numbers. An adult whitetail requires at least 10 or 12 acres on which to browse. This density ensures healthy vegetation and healthy deer. Summer is the season of play and of learning. Already the fawns are beginning to eat what their mother eats. By September, they'll be weaned. And by September, the deer will have grown back their blue-gray, cold-weather coats. The layer of nerves and blood vessels that nourish the buck's growing antlers dries up and begins to itch. In less than a week, the last shreds of velvet will be rubbed away and the new antlers will be polished and gleaming. This is the season of plenty, when the deer put on weight and hunters scout their quarry. All summer, bucks and does have remained apart. The does with their fawns and the bucks at peace with each other. But as October's leaves turn red and gold, the tempo of life quickens as whitetails prepare to meet in the most important rituals of their lives. Early in the rutting season, confrontations seem almost playful. The bucks spend as much time shadow boxing with saplings and branches 
as they do with each other. But this kind of play is ultimately serious. With their proud antlers and swollen necks, the bucks are in splendid condition. Most of them are spoiling for a fight and have little trouble finding one. A musky gland on the inside of the hind legs of both bucks and does and a scent gland near the eye of the buck stimulate the action with their provocative odors. A buck with tines on its antlers is called a rack buck. One without is known as a spike buck. The size and shape of a whitetail's antlers has as much to do with diet as with age. For the antlerless doe, her crowning glory is the white flag of her tail. With it, she signals to her fawns and sometimes to potential mates. During early fall, the deer fatten up on corn, apples, and other crops, as well as on woodland plants. One whitetail does little damage, but a small herd can create havoc in a farmer's field or nibble a newly planted forest to the ground. The solution in Pennsylvania, as in most other states, is a controlled hunting season, which coincides with the rutting season. Individual reasons for hunting are many, and it's not the purpose of this program to either denounce or defend sport hunting. From a game management point of view, the purpose of hunting is the removal of a certain percentage of the animals. Some animals die, so the remaining herd is healthy. In 1897, no whitetail at all were observed in the Keystone State. 10 years later, after conservation-minded people had imported them from other places, 200 bucks were taken. From 1915 until 1958, the number of deer killed by hunters each year increased, as did the total number of deer. Currently, there's a harvest of well over 100,000 animals each season. A whitetail's main advantage is not speed, but wariness, stealth, and intimate knowledge of the hiding places in its home territory. Boy, I tell you, that's a nice whack on that buck. Get this guy. Oh, about 20 miles south of town. Down there. Man is sometimes a force unto himself, but even he is subject to nature's laws. Well, yeah, about dawn. Got him. Man hastens nature's process. The deer that die create a place for those that go on living. By November, the fawns are completely weaned, but they'll continue to stay with their mothers throughout their first year. This little button buck is already thriving on acorns. Older bucks have other things on their mind besides food. In fact, they eat very little during the mating season. Instead, they spend a lot of time making scrape marks along their trails 
and leaving behind scent clues for prospective mates. One of the reasons for the whitetail's prolific success is that bucks reach sexual maturity by age two, and does even earlier, while they're still yearlings. Most bucks do not mate until they're in the prime of life, about three or four years old, like this one. The more mature the buck, the more likelihood that he will pass on to his offspring not only his physical characteristics, but the strength and intelligence to survive. The rut lasts from late October through February. During this period, a doe comes into heat every 28 days for about 30 hours each time. Her odor and attitude reveal whether she's ready to accept the buck. If she's not, he continues his search for a doe that is. One of the most amazing things about whitetails is that, wild as they are, they wander very little. Homebodies, they live their entire lives in an area of less than one square mile. Even if food becomes scarce, they're reluctant to move. Does, as well as bucks, return over and over again to the same scrape marks. Now, at the height of the rut, the watching buck senses that the once reluctant doe is now ready to breed. But the scent of a doe in heat draws other bucks. At this time of year, the deer in a given area have formed a loosely knit herd. A buck following a doe in heat often enters the territory of another buck. Tensions run high as bucks and does are drawn together. tucked under tails and laid back ears give notice that rivalry among these magnificent equals is about to come to blows.
Battles go on until one buck is wounded or too exhausted to fight. Some of the does may scatter. The winner is the buck with enough stamina to follow. Compared to the months of preparation and the strenuous fighting that precede it, the courtship ritual is brief. As a species, whitetails in Pennsylvania may be the most well-observed, thoroughly studied, and carefully managed wild animals in existence, a natural resource to be harvested. But as individuals, each whitetail is still a beautifully wild and untamable creature. Each still lives out its life according to instincts and habits evolved over many centuries. Close association with man may now be the major influence on this deer, but with man's help, it will continue to evolve as our most admired symbol of all wild things. Pennsylvania is a great place, colorful, down home, and all American. Maybe this is because the Keystone State is finding a way to balance its resources so that wild creatures and their habitat are as necessary as industrial development, which seems like a very civilized way of looking at the world to me. As we grow wiser, perhaps we'll learn that all wildlife is valuable. After all, Living free is as important to them as it is to us. And for man as well as for animals, living free means living in harmony with the natural world, as the people of Pennsylvania are learning to do with the Pennsylvania whitetail. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America. Thank you.